What is it, does it does it seem to you like it seems to me like we're, we're kind of living in a, a time of a crisis of confidence? And by that, I don't mean self-confidence. I mean, there's, there's plenty of self-confidence. But the, the kind of confidence where, the, where there's a trust in something bigger than ourselves, a trust in something greater than ourselves. It almost seems like we, we've lost confidence in our ability to determine, you know, what, what is true and what is false, what is, what, what is right. And what is wrong? We're, we're losing our confidence. You know, it was amazing. Does anybody know the significance of July 27th, this last July? Anybody know anything significant that happened on that day? Nobody? Okay, well, on July 27th, in the U.S. Con Congress, there was a hearing. And at that hearing, there was a whistleblower who, under oath, told the United States Congress that he was fully aware that the United States had possession of aliens, of non-human remains, right? And I don't know if that's true or not. I don't think we have aliens. But, but here's the thing that amazed me the most about that story, and it's kind, of, it's kind of proven true in the brief little survey we just took. Because after that happened, you really didn't hear that much about it. Can you imagine 10 years ago if somebody under oath was, was making the claim that we had alien remains? I mean, it seems like the world would have gone crazy. But here in 2023, it was like, oh, oh yeah, aliens. You know, what else is new? And see, part of that is because we just, we just live in this time where there's a crisis of confidence. We hear things, and just because we just really don't know whether to believe if it's true or if it's not true, we really just kind of move on. And because of that, what's added to our lives is this stress, this constant stress, because we, we think about the, the economy, and is the economy going to get better, or is it going to get worse, and what's the answer? We really just don't know, right? And we think about politics, and yeah, it's, it's, it's about to be an election year. Is everybody excited about that? But we think about politics, and we just wonder, are, are we really ever going to be able to, to just get along with one another again? Or is it, is it just going to be from now into eternity just be kind of kind of your tribe and my tribe and we just kind of just don't like each other? Is that the way that it's going to be? We have all of this stress, right? We, we have personal stress when it comes to our, our finances and, and family stress, all these different things going on. You know, maybe you're worried about your job. Is your job going to continue or you've got health problems, and you're not sure what's going on. So in the midst of this crisis of confidence, on top of that, we've got all this stress added to our lives. You know, it's interesting. I was listening to a, a story on the New York Times, and I know some of y'all will say, well, that's your problem, Todd. You're listening to a story on the New York Times. Okay, I understand that. But the story was talking about the, the Florida Coral Reef, which is a, a giant reef of about 340 miles that starts down in, in Key West and goes up the southeastern coast of Florida. But they were talking about a lot of these reefs are, are, reefs are dying. And the way they can tell is when they, go, when they go down and they look at the reefs, because normally these reefs, which are just you know, millions of, of these living organisms, right? So normally when, when they're healthy, they're, they're a brownish color because they've got this algae in them. But when they get stressed, they expel the algae so they become white, almost like they've been bleached. They call it bleaching themselves because they look bleached because they've expelled the algae. So even, even the coral reefs, are feeling the stress. And you may wonder, well, what, what causes a, a coral reef to be stressed? And the answer is current events. Okay. But, 
No. And that part's a joke, but it really is true that, that even the coral reefs are feeling the stress of trying to survive and live in 2023. Well, in reality, when, when Paul writes this letter, this epistle to the Galatians, he's writing to them because, in a sense, they're having a crisis of confidence. Right, because Paul had visited them and told them that salvation, that eternal life, that a relationship with God is found in Jesus, that he has provided that, that he is the way. And so then Paul leaves, and after him comes these, these Judaizers, the, these agitators, and they begin to tell them that, no, what you need is, you need in addition to Jesus, you need the law. So in the middle of this crisis of belief, Paul is going to write to them. And he's going to say, here's something you can have confidence in. It's, it's, it's bigger than me, and it's bigger than the Judaizers. It, it's God's promise. It's what God has promised. You can put your hope and your confidence in that. So Paul's saying, you, really, you don't have to believe what I'm telling you. You don't have to believe what they're saying. What you need to believe is what God has promised. So this morning we'll pick up in Galatians chapter 3, and we'll begin in verse 15 and read through around verse 25. So Galatians chapter 3, beginning in verse 15. Paul says, To give a human example, brothers, even with a man-made covenant, no one annuls it or adds to it once it has been ratified. Now, the promises were made to Abraham and to his offspring. It does not say into his offsprings, referring to many, but referring to one and to your offspring, who is Christ. This is what I mean. The law, which came 430 years afterward, does not annul a covenant previously ratified by God so as to make the promise void. For the inheritance comes by the law. It no longer comes by promise, but God gave it to Abraham by a promise. Why then the law? It was added because of transgressions until the offspring should come to whom the promise had been made, and it was put in place through angels by an intermediary. Now, an intermediator implies more than one, but God is one. Is the law then contrary to the promise of God? Certainly not. For if a law had been given that could give life, then righteousness would indeed be by the law. But the scripture imprisoned everything under sin, so that the promise by faith in Jesus Christ might be given to those who believe. Now, before faith came, we were held captive under the law, imprisoned until the coming faith would be revealed. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for your word. God, we thank you for the, the promises that it contains. God, chief of all, we thank you for the promise of the gospel, of the good news that came through your son, Jesus. God, we rejoice in that this morning. I pray, God, as we, as we live through this, this season, this time of where well, there seems to be a, a crisis of of, of, of confidence, God, where we seem to have lost our ability to, to trust and put our hope and our confidence in anything outside of our own selves. God, I pray that you would give us confidence in your word this morning, confidence in the promise that it contains. In Jesus' name, amen. So the first thing we're going to see in this passage is that we can be confident, that we are confident because God will keep his promise. Again, verse 15 through 18, Paul says, To give a human example, brothers, even with a man-made covenant, no one annuls it or adds to it once it has been ratified. Now the promises were made to Abraham and to his offspring. It does not say into his offsprings, referring to many, but referring to one, and to your offspring who is Christ. This is what I mean. The law, which came 430 years afterward, does not annul a covenant previously ratified by God so as to make the promise void. For the, if the inheritance comes by the law, it no longer comes by promise, but by God who gave it to Abraham by a promise. So Paul again is referring to the Galatians as brothers. Right? If, if you've been with us, you know that, that Paul has had some pretty strong things to say about the Galatians. Like they've been bewitched, like they've been tricked they've been fooled like well, like who who has made them lose their mind but now he's reminding them look we're, we're we're brothers okay we we are we are in this together and the key word in this passage if you read it carefully paul at least three times is going to use this word promise 
In other words, Paul's saying to these brothers, these sisters, these, these people that he cares about, here's something that you can cling to. Here's something you can depend on. Here's something that can't be revoked, and it's God's promise. It's not even something that we can accidentally dismiss. Like you ever thought like, like, like if you're in some sort of a warranty deed or something and you didn't take the car to the right deal or you're like, well, I, I meant to do the right thing, but I didn't do the right thing, so now everything's annulled and nothing counts. Paul's saying you can't even accidentally, not even by your own negligence, can you nullify God's promise because it's God's promise to us. God is going to keep. God is going to fulfill his promise. So what is this promise? Verse 16 says, now the promises were made to Abraham and to his offspring. It does not say and to offsprings, referring to many, but referring to one, and to your offspring, who is Christ. In other words, Paul's saying to these Galatians, the promise that was made to Abraham was the coming of Jesus. The promise that was made to Abraham is that he would have an offspring. Yeah, we know the story of when God tells him that the stars in the sky, that's how many his offspring will be. But Paul's saying in addition to that, Paul promised to Abraham that he would have one very specific offspring who would be Jesus, who would be the Christ, the Messiah, the one who came to save us. Verse 17 says, this is what I mean, the law which came 430 years afterward does not annul a covenant previously ratified by God so as to make the promise void. Paul's saying God's promise to Adam, it, it can't be nullified, which literally means to, to destroy or to release. Paul's saying there's, there's nothing that can mess up God's promise. Right? There, there's nothing in our lives, in the future, in the present, in the past, there's nothing in our lives that can annul or destroy God's promise promise, right? There's nothing in, 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 even in our sinfulness that can annul God's promise. Even our mistakes can't annul God's promise. Our rebellion can't annul God's promise. Our choices can't annul God's promise. Sometimes we think, even if it's not sinful, we think, well, you know, there was a period in my life and, and I couldn't make up my mind between this route or that route, and, and I decided to go this direction. And, right, and somehow we think we're, we're in prison for the rest of their lives to wonder, well, what if? What if I had gone that other direction? How would things have been different? Would things have been better? Would things have been worse? Paul's saying God's promise is not nullified even by our choices. So we can relax and trust God. He's going to do what he has promised. Whatever it is in our lives that maybe you're, you're tempted to think, well, maybe that's done it. Maybe God's going to revoke his promise to me because of that. God won't revoke his promise promise. There's never going to be a, a season. There's never going to be a, a time or a moment when God says, well, well that was a bridge too far. You know, I, I, I would have kept my promise up to this and this and this, but when you did this, that was too far. That, that's the end of the line. No, God, God doesn't have that limit because it's God's promise. He is going to keep his promise. That's why Paul's saying God's promise is superior to the law. It's more significant. It's more important than the law. And there, there's a couple reasons for that. One, he says, because it became came before the law. It was, it was prior to the law. And he's going to use the years 430 years. Because what he's saying is between Abraham, when God made that promise to Abraham, and, and Moses, when God gave the law to the Israelites, was 430 years. So he's saying the promise that God made to Abraham predates and therefore is, is, is above, is superior to the law. Of course, if you want to look further, you can see in Genesis 3.15, actually, it's the first time God expressed on earth that promise. Because if, if you're familiar with the book of Genesis, you know, Genesis 1 and 2 describes God's creation of the world and of the universe. And then in Genesis 3, we have the description of the fall. When man, when Adam and Eve rebelled against God, when they sinned, and so there was a curse. But this was in the midst of that curse, this is the promise that God gave to Eve. He said, I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. 
What's he saying? He, he's, he's promising. He, he's letting Satan know in the presence of Adam and Eve that yes, there, there's a curse, but ultimately Satan is going to be defeated. I am going to send one who will be of the seed of woman, who will be a descendant of Eve, who will break that curse. So all the way back in the very beginning, you've got this promise. And then in, in Genesis 15, 18, when God makes the promise to Abraham, he says, on that day, the Lord made a covenant with Abram, saying to your offspring, I give this land and from the river of Egypt to the great river, the river Euphrates. So what's he saying? You, you, will, you will inherit this. I'm going to give this to you. This is my promise to you. And it's going to come through an offspring, a very specific offspring. So Paul's telling these Galatians, no, no, the, the promise that God made is not nullified because of the law that he gave 430 years later. Really, you could take the promise if you want to go even further back because in, in, in Paul or Peter's epistle in 1 Peter and in the John's writing of the book of Revelation, it says that the lamb was slain before the foundation of the world. What on earth does that mean? That means that before God even created the world, fully knowing that when he created it, that you and I, that people would rebel, that we would sin, before he even did that, his plan was already in place. He already knew what he was going to do. He already knew that he was going to send his son Jesus as our Savior. So God's promise predates even the creation of the world. And Paul's saying because of that, it, it's not nullified by this law that came 430 years after it was announced to Abraham. The other reason that the, that the, the promise is superior is because the nature of the promise, right? Because the, the promise is based on what God does. It's God's promise. You see, in the covenant, in the law, there's man has a role. It's a, it's a conditional law, right? When a promise is a gift, that is what God is doing for us. Our only, our only role there is to receive the gift that God is promising to us. That's what Galatians 3.18 says, For if the inheritance comes by the law, it no longer comes by promise. But God gave it to Abraham by a promise. So why would God's promise not be nullified? Because it was a matter of grace. It was a matter of a gift. It was a matter of what God has done for us. It's a promise that's guaranteed because of God's sovereignty, because his plans, as Job says, will not be thwarted. His promise wasn't based on our ability to, to measure up. It wasn't based on our ability to do anything. It was based on what God was doing. He says, what was he giving them? He was giving them an inheritance. And to the Jews, in their mind, that this, this meant land. It meant the promised land. But ultimately, that inheritance is Christ himself and the salvation that he is bringing to us. Paul says that God gave the promise. Literally, that, that he graciously continues to give. In other words, it's God's grace. It's his gift. His promise is a gift to us. Somebody defined a promise as a free and unconstrained decision to commit oneself or specific objects to another. See, sometimes we think, well, in the Old Testament, that's when, that's when God was, was really harsh on sin, right? That's when if, if, you, if you did something bad, you know, God really let you have it. He really punished you. That, that's the Old Testament. And then we think, well, the New Testament, that's what, when God suddenly became gracious and giving and full of grace and mercy and forgiving well, what Paul's doing, he's making the case that before the law ever came, God's graciousness, his promised gift to us was already in place. So God has always been gracious to his creation. That's why Calvin says, let us carefully remember the reason why in comparing the promise with the law, the establishment of the one overturns the other. The reason is this, that the promise has respect to faith and the law to works. Faith receives what is freely given, but to works a reward is paid. And he immediately adds, God gave it to Abraham, not by requiring some sort of compensation on his heart part, but by the free promise. For if you view it as conditional, the word gave would be utterly 
inapplicable to the promise of Jesus, the promise of salvation, the good news, the gospel. That's God's gift to us, not something that we earn or merit. John Bunyan, in, in, in a poem, he writes this. He says, Run, John, run, the law commands, but gives us neither feet nor hands. Far better news the gospel brings. It bids us fly and gives us wings. So you see the difference? Let me read that again and just let it sink in. Run, John, run, the law commands, but gives us neither feet nor hands. Far better news the gospel brings. It bids us fly and gives us wings. So God has given us a promise. And because of that, you can have confidence, not in your ability, not in my ability to, to fulfill it or to get it done or to obey it, but we can have confidence because God has given us that and God will keep his promise. The other reason that we can have confidence, even in a, even in a crisis of confidence that we live in, is because God's promise his, his, his law, his covenant points us ultimately to his promise, as does everything in our lives, right? Romans 8 teaches us this, that, that God is up to something good in everything that he does, both good and bad. And part of that is to point us to his promise. Part of that is to point us to his faithfulness. And so when, when, when God gave us the law, he gave us the Old Testament covenant, Part of that was he was giving us that in order to point us ultimately to the promise that we would need to depend on. Beginning in verse 19, he says, Why then the law? It was added because of transgressions, until the offspring should come to whom the promise had been made, and it was put in place through angels by an intermediary. Now, an intermediator implies more than one, but God is one. Is the law then contrary to the promise of God? Certainly not. For if a law had been given that could give life, then righteousness would indeed be by the law. But the scripture imprisoned everything under sin so that the promise by faith in Jesus Christ might be given to those who believe. Now, before faith came, we were held captive under the law, imprisoned until the coming faith would be revealed. So then the law was our guardian until Christ came in order that we might be justified by faith. So Paul asks the question, well, why then the law? If, if the promise is what matters, if the promise is what we cling to, then why, why did God even give us the law? Because God gave the law, so we know that the law is good, right? God gave the law, so we know that the law has a purpose. There is a reason for it. So Paul is going to spell this out. In verse 19, he makes it clear that the law was added. In other words, the law had a definite beginning point. Unlike the promise of Christ, which was in the mind and the plans of God in, in eternity past before the creation of the universe, the law was given at a very specific time and place. It had a definite beginning point. And he says, until, until the offspring should come. In other words, not only does it have a definite beginning point, but it has a definite ending point. It has a time when it will be fulfilled, when it will have fulfilled its purpose. And of course, we know from the New Testament that when Jesus came, what he did was he fulfilled the law. So in the meantime, what, what did the law do? What was the purpose? If God gave us the law and it's good and he gave us the law and it has a purpose, what was that purpose? Well, one, the law exasperates sin. Paul says that, that it makes sin a transgression. In other words, it turns sin into a conscious, deliberate, disobedient act to God's law. So you and I, we are, we are created in the image of God. So we, in a sense, we have a sense of, of what is right and what is wrong. But when God gave the law, he made it clear. This is, this is my standard. Suddenly, sin became not just sin, not just something in our conscience that we felt bad about, but something that was punishable. It's almost if, if, if you had you know, two kids in your house and they were just, they were just toddlers, just, just little guys, and one of, them, one of them hit the other and the other one started crying, right? From, from the beginning, that, I mean, the toddler would know that that was wrong, right? He's created in God's image. He knows that when you hit somebody and they cry, they're hurting. They, he knows that was a bad thing to do, right? He, he understands that. But when the parent comes in and says, Johnny, you can't do that. 
You can't hit your little brother. That's wrong. That's bad. Suddenly it is taken that sin, it's taken that behavior to a whole new level. Suddenly that's become part of the family code. Suddenly it's not just an offense because I feel bad because he's crying or something inside of me tells me that's wrong, but now I understand. Now that's, that's not what we do in, in our family. I don't want to violate the, the rules, the, the norms of, of what my family does. So Paul says it took sin and made it a transgression. It took sin and spelled it out. It showed exactly what was wrong. You see, the law reveals sin. The the law shows us not just that it's wrong and makes us feel bad, but it shows us who the sin is against, that it's against the law giver. The one who gave the law is who the sin is against. It shows us the seriousness of sin because suddenly sin... You're right, just doesn't exist in our conscience, but we know that there, there's consequences for it, right? We commit sin and we receive consequences. So the law, which showed us sin, and it showed us the consequences and the seriousness of sin. But what the law couldn't do, right, as Paul says, was give life, right? The, the gospel, faith in Jesus, is what, is what changes our hearts, changes our, our desires, it changes what we want to do. It gives us the desire to do what is right instead of what is wrong. Verses 19 and 20 say, and it was put in place through angels by an intermediary. Now an intermediary implies more than one, but God is one. Of course, when he's talking about mediator, mediator, thank you, he's talking about Moses, because Moses was the mediator between two parties, between God and the people of Israel. You see, the law was between God's people and God. And because of that, because there were, there were multiple parties involved, right, people had a role, right? Their role was to either obey the law or disobey the law. And of course, the other party is God, and he's got a role. His role is to either either bless because of obedience or curse because of disobedience. That was the nature of the law. It was a conditional agreement, right? So with the law, you, you do good things, you obey, and good things happen, right? But if you disobey, then bad things happen, right? And that's why it's an inferior to the promise because anytime we're involved, right, anytime people are involved, what are we going to do? We're going to mess it up, right? We're going to disobey more than obey. We're going to receive the curse more than the blessing. And God, understanding this, right, gave us the law to show us that we needed something greater, that we needed something outside of ourselves, that we needed to rely on Him and His promise in order to receive salvation, in order to receive forgiveness and be restored in our relationship with him. So Paul asks the question, well, is, is there a contradiction then? Is there, is there a contradiction between the law and the promise of God's gift? Verse 21 says, is the law then contrary to the promise of God? Certainly not. For if the law had been given that could give life, then righteousness would indeed be by the law. So Paul's not so subtle answer to the question, is there a contradiction between the law and and the promise of God's free gift. He says, absolutely not. And then continues in verse 22, but the scripture imprisoned everything under sin so that the promise by faith in Jesus Christ might be given to those who believe. Now, before faith came, we were held captive under the law, imprisoned until the coming faith would be the revealed. So what what could the law not do? What was the law incapable of doing? The law could not give life, right? So so implicit here in Galatians, and Paul's going to make this more explicit, more specific in his epistle to the Romans, is that God gave us this law, but people are incapable. People, you and I, we're incapable of keeping that law. And so because of that, we have to look for something greater than ourselves. In other words, when, when, when he gave us the law, it's almost like we became under it, right? You ever heard of a coworker or a friend like, how you doing? They're like, I'm under it, right? That, that's, not a, that's, not a, that's, not, that's not the same as fine or doing great or fantastic, right? Under it means I'm, I'm swamped, I'm overwhelmed, I, I, need, I need help, somebody help me. And throughout Galatians, Paul's going to use that phrase, under. And th- in chapter 3, verse 10, he says, under a curse, Verse 22, he said, under sin. 
Verse 23 says, under the law. And then in a passage we'll look at next week, verse 25, he's going to talk about being under a guardian. Right? When you're under something, what do you want to do? You want to get out from underneath it, right? You want to get, it's like, remember when Kevin Harvin preached here and he talked about, you know, being, being caught under that raft when he was whitewater rafting. And the, the one thought that was going through his mind is, I've got to get out from underneath this, right? When you're underneath something, you want to get out from it. So Paul's saying that the law showed us that we're under this law, we're under sin, so we need to look for a way to get out of it. And that escape, the way out of it, was God's promise. You see, the law causes circumstances. It causes us to look for God's promise, something that we can rely on bigger than ourselves. We have to ask ourselves the question, and what, what, are, we, what are we under, right? And are, are we willing to, to examine, look, and say, God, I feel like I'm under this, but is, is, is your promise bigger than this? Is your promise the answer? In other words, what, what is the source of your pressure, what, what is the, the thing or the circumstance that you feel like it's just so much pressure on you, like you're under it, and you need God's promise, you need something bigger than you to rescue you, right? Maybe that's financial, but you know what? God's Word gives us a promise for that. Matthew chapter five, or 6, verse 26 says, Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? What's he saying? You may feel under it financially, but God is going to take care of you. That is a promise. God is not going to let you fail. Right? Maybe, maybe you're under it is temptation. Maybe there's some sin that you just can't seem to get victory over. Well, there's a promise for that. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13 says, No temptation has ever overtaken you that is not common to man. God is faithful, and He will not let you be tempted beyond your ability, but with the temptation, He will also provide the way of escape that you may be able to endure it. Right? You ever been tempted to, to do something, to make a wrong decision, or to, to loaf on something that you should be given energy or effort to, and you just think, if, if you know, these are just my circumstances. You know, other people don't have it like I have it, so I, I feel justified in doing this. Paul saying to this church in Corinthians, no, no, no. Not, not only has every person faced temptation, but in addition to that, God is faithful and God is going to provide a way out. God is providing a way for you to have victory over that temptation if you're willing to receive it. That's a promise. So when you feel that pressure of being under temptation, God's promising you. You're not doomed to that. There's a way out. Right? You ever feel family pressure, like your family's just chaos, and it's just, it just like never seems to end? Colossians chapter 1, verse 11 through 12 says, "...being strengthened with all power according to His glorious might, for all endurance and patience with joy, giving thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints in light." Does that sound like something when you're in the middle of, of family chaos, that you could use endurance, that you could use patience, maybe that you could use a little bit of joy. Well, God's promising us that. God is providing that. Maybe what you're under is just this, this kind of epidemic of, of loneliness that seems to be in our society. The more connected we become, the, se the more it seems people struggle with loneliness. And yet Hebrews 13, 5 says, and he said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. So even in the, the loneliest of moments, you can know with confidence if everybody else has abandoned you and left you alone. God has not abandoned you, and God has not, nor will he ever leave you alone. We also live in what seems to be an epidemic of, of depression, of just sadness, of just sorrow. And, and people, you know, by definition, it just seems like there's a, a cloud, what, over them, right? That pressure, that being under something. And yet 1 Thessalonians 5.18 says, Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for us. So what's the promise there? Whatever your circumstance is, God has done something. God has blessed you in some way. God has given you something that you can be thankful for. Even in the midst of our depression, one of the greatest cures for depression 
is gratitude. It's looking around us and saying, God, what are the things that I have that I can be thankful for? And then finally, anxiety. You ever feel like anxiety is just on you? Somebody has described it as like an, an waking up and there's like an elephant on your chest. Are you familiar with that? It's, it's anxiety. It's just that, that sense that just something's not right. It's almost a, a fearfulness of something that hasn't even happened. And yet Philippians 4, 6 says, Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. So even in the middle of, of anxious moments, he's promising you, I'm here, I'm available. Have a thankful heart, and whatever it is that's worrying you, that's causing this anxiety, if you can pinpoint it, bring it to me, cast it on me, and I can take care of you. So just like the law was intended to, to point us right to the promise, the law which we, we quickly realize we cannot keep, points us to the promise that God's going to keep on our behalf. He also uses circumstances in our lives, things that we think we can't handle or we're not big enough or strong enough to handle. God's saying, I've got a promise for you. I'm going to help you through that. I'm not going to leave you alone in that moment. So in the midst of right, a, a culture and a time where there's a crisis of a lack of confidence, God's saying to us, you can have confidence in the promises that I've made. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you that you have, you have made a way. God, for our biggest need, which is, is to have a restored relationship with you because that's why we were created and that's why we, we were made. God, we thank you that you had a plan and a promise and that you fulfill your promises. So this morning, God, we say that, that we can't keep your, your law. God, that it, it's your, your standard of perfection, your standard of holiness is too much for us. So we're leaning on you. We're leaning on your promise. We're leaning on the truth that when you sent your son Jesus to die on our behalf, that you were fulfilling a promise that was in your mind even before you created us. God, what an amazing thought to, to know that even knowing that you would have to send your son to rescue us from our own foolishness. You are still willing to create us and to make us. And God, I pray that you would give us wisdom as we face all manner of circumstances in our lives. God, whether it's depression or anxiety or just stress or whatever the case may be, temptation. God, give us the, the wisdom and the faith and the confidence to lean on you and your promises for victory over all things. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's stand together.